I purchased a watermelon. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my stagey YouTube channel. If you are meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe. I am obsessed with all things theatre, and this is my YouTube channel, where I review the shows that I have been invited to go and see as a professional, freelance, independent theatre critic here in the UK. And tonight, I was invited by the lovely team at Chloe Nelkin Consulting to go to the gala night performance of Dirty Dancing, the classic film live on stage at the Dominion Theatre in the West End in London. Now, even though this production has been going around for ages, it's played multiple theatres in the West End, it has toured since the beginning of time, I have somehow never seen this on stage, even though I am quite a big fan of the film. More on that later. Uh, so, I tentatively accepted the invitation to this performance um, when I got invited last year. And I say tentatively because this is definitely a show that has a reputation that precedes it, certainly among the theatre community. It is not considered the most high art, high brow piece of theatre. A lot of people weren't necessarily happy to see it coming back to the Dominion Theatre again for a second year in a row, but we're going to talk about all of that. Because controversially, though a big part of me was expecting not to really love this production, maybe even to hate it, I actually really enjoyed myself. I had a really nice time this evening at the Dominion Theatre, and I'm going to tell you all about it. Oh, I haven't shown you the programme. Here it is. Here it is. Is this not the world's biggest souvenir brochure? Look! Shiny! It's bigger than my head. It literally it literally doesn't share the frame with me, so it needs to go back over here. Now, before I get into today's review video, if you enjoy this one, make sure to subscribe to my stage YouTube channel. If this is the first video you're seeing, I do these all the time. I go to like anywhere between three and five shows a week. I review as many of them as I can for my YouTube channel, and I also talk about theatre news and gossip and drama, and I listen to cast recordings, and I do fun things. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of my upcoming content. And you can also click on the link in the description to join my channel members and get access to my exclusive content as well, including more about Dirty Dancing, the full curtain call, and our first impressions reviews when we left the Gala Night performance. Spoiler alert, not everyone who was with me agreed with my opinions about the show. But for now, we're going to talk about what I thought about the show. So here it is, my thoughts about Dirty Dancing. So the thing with Dirty Dancing that people may not expect is it is not strictly a musical. It's really not a musical. It is the film on stage, and that is the most accurate description I can make of this show. They have done a very faithful job in taking this beloved film and putting it onto a stage. And the aesthetics are familiar. The costuming, the hair, the choreography is the same. It's exactly what you're expecting to see, it's nostalgic, it's familiar, we're hitting all of the same emotional beats, it's not like we're doing a whole like verbatim, you must go upwards with this inflection and all of those things, but there are obviously certain hallmarks of the film that we're expecting to see, and not just the I carried a watermelon and the nobody puts baby in a corner, but like the, the sassy takedowns of the terrible waiter character and various different bits that we recognize throughout the plot and various different iconic visual scenes the practicing of the lifts in the water and the the bits of choreography in their first mambo dance and then the dance at the end and it succeeds in hitting all of those beats but it is quite rigid in terms of taking this film and putting it on stage. Not that I think it's the only show that does that. I would compare Back to the Future and Sleepless the Musical as two other shows I saw recently that quite faithfully and quite strictly adapt a screenplay for the stage. Now, Back to the Future incorporated a lot of other things, obviously. They wrote a whole bunch of new songs. It really was a musical. And because it was a sci-fi film, they had to utilize a whole bunch of special effects. Dirty Dancing doesn't have any of that. And the thing that jars with people about Dirty Dancing is it is not a musical. You have the songs from the film, you have that whole iconic soundtrack, and not just, I have the time of my life. 
but also songs like Yes and Hungry Eyes and Do You Love Me and the unforgettable Kellerman's Anthem. Voices, hearts and hands. But those songs are not really sung by characters involved in the plot. You do not get Baby or Johnny singing at any point in this show. The singing happens around them and sometimes it's diegetic uh, which means that it's being sung by people who would actually be singing in the world like someone who is performing with a band while there's dancing happening as like an entertainment evening or baby sister lisa singing her little hula number and at other times it functions like music would in a film where we're just hearing this song uh, underscoring a particular scene, a romantic scene or something else and that's sung by any of the other characters on stage, most of whom are not named characters within the context of the show. The point is for some people they expect the lead characters uh, to be singing because they thought it was going to be a musical and it is not really a musical. I would say it bears similarities to My Neighbor Totoro in that way, except for the fact that My Neighbor Totoro obviously deploys a great many more creative theatrical techniques in order to deliver that piece of storytelling. Now, controversially, I don't actually mind that these characters do not sing. I've often said that it's important that people sing their feelings in musicals, and Strictly Ballroom I was quite critical of because I wanted them to sing their feelings more and at more important points within the plot. I thought that was used to minimal effect. Here, I don't mind that Baby and Johnny don't sing because normally in a musical, singing is used to express emotions, right? We are articulating our feelings using song for the most part. And these characters express those same feelings quite clearly using dance. Because of the nature of this show and the nature of this plot, dance is the language of their emotional storytelling. So I don't need for them to sing at all. We have the music happening and that's fantastic and there are some lovely vocal performances by those who are doing the singing, but those characters are telling us everything we need to know about the development of their relationship and their feelings using dance. And the more you think about it, the more that makes perfect sense for this show. I will say, one of the more egregious moments of just transposing this film onto the stage is when we have the front curtain come down and through a gauze panel we see them balancing on the log and then in the water practicing the lifts there is no water they don't appear wet at all we're just seeing them sort of behind a gauze screen and it's at that point that you feel like you may as well be in a cinema and you really question why these actors are faithfully recreating a film sequence so specifically so that we can feel like we're watching that exact film sequence. I mean, there are definitely moments that would be improved and would be more theatricalized if they weren't trying to be so faithful to the film. Another one I could mention is in the second act, and I will be talking about some spoilers here because I have to just to articulate this point. So Penny goes to give a dance lesson to Baby's parents, the Housemans. Penny then strikes up a conversation with Baby's mother, whose name I don't remember, but she's played by... I was going to say Emily Gilmore, by Kelly Bishop in the film. But this is the moment where Penny reveals what has happened to her and clues in Baby's mother about what has been going on and how Dr. Houseman helped her in all of that situation by essentially giving her emergency medical intervention after she had a backroom abortion. At this point, if you don't know Dirty Dancing, the plot is more intense than you may have realised. But when they have this conversation, we see Penny breaking down in tears and the light gets this purple wash and it sort of fades down and they start miming this silent conversation as uh, Mrs. Houseman is comforting her. And I was waiting for this set piece to roll back and something to then happen in front and for that to be a scene transition because the music uh, became instrumental over the top of them and that's normally what would happen. But they just stayed there, had this silent conversation with music over the top of it, and then the music faded down, the lights came back up, and then the scene carried on. And I realized the only reason that was happening is because they just didn't have lines from the film to get them through that moment. It was like, on stage, it would totally make sense if we saw this, if we saw this conversation and heard what they had to say to each other, but we just don't have anything in that bit of film. That doesn't exist in the film, so we just can't get through that scene. That was an odd, odd moment. And there are certainly other points of the plot that could be expanded on. The act break does also make me laugh. 
because in a play you would try and put the act break at some sort of peak of tension or drama or some big turning point in the plot and in a musical you would do similarly some sort of really big moment. You think of Alphaba flying, you think of the flag waving in One Day More. It tickles me that in Dirty Dancing we do not end on a song but we just end on the two of them about to bang for the first time and we see quite a lot of it. I will also add quite risque. It is a little bit risque. It felt like voyeurism just occasionally because of some of the more sexually explicit scenes. It did feel a little bit softcore at times, some of the things you were watching. And there was a lot of cheering for that from the audience. It had big hen night energy. I would say the vibes of this production are just somewhere between Pretty Woman and Dream Boys. If you don't know what that is, if you're one of my American audiences, that's the UK equivalent of Magic Mike, basically and a hen night is a bachelorette party. I just need an American translator to get through this video. But they were really happy for like the male disrobing moments. I actually felt one of the more graphic moments uh, was just when uh, they have that scene where the three of them are rehearsing the mambo dance sequence where Penny is helping them and she's wearing this leotard and the way she was moving her hips, I mean, power to her, but that was, that was explicit, I thought. In any case, between that and some of the more serious themes of the show, it is not particularly child-friendly. But then there's no difference between that and the film. It's not like it's more graphic on stage. I mean, possibly just because you're watching actual people in front of you, but there's not like nudity nudity any more than you would see in a bunch of other West End shows. So let that be either a comfort or a disappointment to you. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you were hoping for. So like I mentioned in the introduction of this video, I am a fan of this film. Inexplicably, when I was a teenager, I became obsessed with this VHS copy that my parents had and I, I took it up to my room and I watched it every night for like a month after which I'm pretty sure I got bored and I moved on to Rugrats in Paris. Like I was too young to be watching this VHS, but was really obsessed with Dirty Dancing and probably around the same time that I was getting really into ballroom dancing and choreography. And I haven't watched the film in years, but watching it this evening, uh, depicted on stage, there was an awful lot of nostalgia and fondness. And so does that play into my enjoyment of the show? Absolutely. But then I think that's a given. I think it's a weird criticism to level against this to say, well, only people who enjoy the film are going to like this on stage. That's a big enough market of people. It's an iconic film. Plenty of people. I mean, it's in one of the biggest theatres in London. It's returning for a second year. It has toured successfully for years. Clearly enough people love this film that they are willing to go and see it performed on stage. It's a given that people who like musicals should go to musicals. People who like Shakespeare should go to Shakespeare. People who like Dirty Dancing should go and see Dirty Dancing. Do I think you need to love the film to enjoy this production? I think certainly you probably need to like the film. It does play into the nostalgia of it all. Having seen it this evening with at least one friend who had never seen the film before, they really struggled A, to enjoy this production and B, to understand what was going on. So I do think it's a given. If you love this film, there's a lot to enjoy here and it might be more of a risk to see this production if you don't love the film. So all of this being said, you know, my reasons for enjoying the show and some of the criticisms I had against it, I do think it is still a three star production. I think there is a certain lack of creativity in just taking this beloved film and just putting it onto the stage. But that being said, I had a really nice time. I was really enjoying myself. There were some great moments. There were some great performances. I'm going to carry on to talk about some of those. Um, and it would be a, th a high three star. I was expecting a lower three, maybe even a two. I thought I was going to be coming on here to tell you that I hated this show this evening. Who do I sound like? <gasps> I sound like Amy Hart on Love Island. I was coming here to tell you I hated it. And I didn't. I did not hate Dirty Dancing at the Dominion Theatre. I actually had a really great time. I really enjoyed it and it was really fun. So through a critical lens, it is still a three star production because of various shortcomings, some of which I've mentioned, some of which I'll go into, but I had a nice time. I think it's one of those shows, like with Pretty Woman, if you give yourself over to it, then it's easy for you to enjoy. 
That being said, let's talk about some of my favourite parts of the show and some of my favourite performances. So Charlotte Gooch, who plays Penny, has been doing so in this show for a while. She has played this role in various different West End theatres. On the first ever national tour, she opened the German production I've been reading. Uh, she is fantastic. She is not only a phenomenal actress, I saw her in Singing in the Rain as well as Kathy Selden. She's an incredible dancer, like mesmerizing phenomenal. And that's what the beginning of this show needs. When you first meet her and Johnny, it's really her who wows you, as is the way in a lot of ballroom and Latin dancing. You know, the girls get the, the showy addresses, they get to do the more exciting things, they get picked up, they kick their legs over their head. She's got long blonde hair, she's whipping around, she's pulling focus in that moment. But she is sensational. There is no other word for it. And her acting scenes with the tough things that Penny has to go through. I think she has some of the most challenging acting to do in this show because she has some real grief-stricken moments when she's coping with um, some devastating stuff. I also really enjoyed Danny Colligan. So Danny is an alumnus of Les Mis and he was really great in this. He was charming. He was quirky. He was playing Billy, who is Johnny's cousin, who also works at Kellerman's. He's the guy who carries all the watermelons uh, and meets Baby on the way up to the party. He was really fun. And I love that he got to showcase his vocals towards the end of the show. He sang two songs. He got this great vocal moment right downstage that got a big cheer. And then he also got to sing the male part of I've had the time of my life, which is honor enough in this show, let me tell you, because everyone is waiting for it. And my final highlight performance shout out goes to Georgina Castle. Georgina, who has just finished performing in Elf on the same stage at the Dominion Theatre. I wonder if she moved dressing rooms. I don't know. But she is hilarious. She plays baby's sister Lisa, and she's a little more glam than I remember her from the film. But she was really funny, and she wasn't overwhelmingly irritating as this character could risk being. I just thought she was fun. Now, perhaps conspicuously, I haven't mentioned the two leading performances in that section. And that is maybe a little bit unfair because they do showcase an awful lot of talent. And I don't wish to take away from that, but I do have just a couple of notes um, about areas where their performances could and perhaps ought to have been a little bit stronger. So Kira Malou is playing Francis Baby Houseman. And through no fault of hers, I just wish the production highlighted and featured her more. It seems crazy to say that because she gives us this opening narration and we follow her throughout the show. But just from a tech perspective, when she stood downstage to give that opening thing, the music was too loud behind her and the light was too soft on her. There was this front spotlight that wasn't doing the job it was meant to be doing for a couple of people and she was just too dimly lit and too thinly heard, and I wanted her to have more prominence. One thing that musicals understand is when you need to know a character is giving you important dialogue, they know how to turn your attention to that character. Bam, with a spotlight, the music is going to cue you into it, the direction is going to show you this person is speaking here, and that's what we were missing at that moment, the significance of her. In a film, we're going to pay attention because we don't have a whole stage to look at with various different things pulling focus. It's so much easier to direct an audience's focus on screen, but it's harder to do that on stage. And that's where I think this show lacks the sophistication of a more cleverly directed theatrical piece. And I wanted her to have just a little bit more gravitas and a little bit more presence. And there's something really magic about Jennifer Grey. And she captures a lot of that essence and she does a wonderful job of mimicry. She looks just like her. She gets the same vibe down. Her transformation throughout the show is lovely. In particular, the scene where she is standing up and advocating for Johnny when he's been wrongly accused of stealing from one of the guests. And she has to admit things that she doesn't want to in front of her family. That's a really lovely scene and the scenes that she has with him as well. I just wish there was room in the show for her to bring a little bit more of her own individuality and a little bit more charm that isn't just trying to give you like the Jennifer Grey slight emotional repression thing, like the shyness, I think. I don't know. It's a little bit, again, like with much of the rest of the show, just like too much in the shadow of this film version and trying to adhere strictly to that. 
Michael O'Reilly is a phenomenal, phenomenal dancer. He dances beautifully and he has the authority and he has the attitude of Johnny Castle down. Again, he looks enough like Patrick Swayze, not as much a dead ringer for him as Kira does for Jennifer Grey. He also spends much of the show being objectified by the production and the audience, like they make a big thing about him taking his shirt off at various points and it gets wolf whistled to death. But this is a show that does wear its sensuality on its sleeve. I just wish that his facial muscles had as much flexibility as his pelvis. Because in dance, he is fantastic and so expressive and so characterized. And there's not as much of that through the face. And arguably, Patrick Swayze was similar. There is a stoicism, but Patrick Swayze had those moments in the film where he really comes alive. I'm thinking about when they're crawling around in the dance studio and lip syncing to that song, and he's so expressively lip syncing. I did not get that from Michael O'Reilly. He just seemed fairly stoic throughout, and so I didn't notice where he was starting to feel more passionately towards baby and where that was starting to affect his decision making and all of these things. He just seemed sort of similarly disgruntled the entire time. Highlight moment of the show. I really liked the early dance scenes and the whole finale sequence. It is cheered to death by people in the audience. I was there at a gala night performance. Who's to say if that's more or less screamy than usual? I dare say if you're there on a Friday or a Saturday night, you will get much of the same thing because people like to drink on the weekend. But that final sequence of the show where they're doing a time of my life and they're doing the lift and the iconic lines and nobody's putting baby in a corner and all of that stuff, that is really, really well done. My favorite was also my favorite song on the soundtrack. I love the song, Yes. It is on my running playlist and when it comes on and I'm on a treadmill, I run dangerously fast because this song is such a bop. It's the one that's like, yes, bam, 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 we're gonna fall in love, gonna be tonight. Yes, bam, 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 that one. So I had momentarily forgotten it was in this soundtrack and then when it started I got so excited and they brought Georgina Castle on and she spent the whole first verse and chorus getting changed into the outfit she was going to wear on her date to do what the lyrics of the song say. Think about it. And I was starting to lose my mind a little bit because I thought if they do not bring on the ensemble and make them jive to this perfect jive song, I'm gonna lose my mind. Thankfully, they did on the second verse, and that was so, so great. And there was energy, and I think just more dance throughout the show. There are scene transition moments that would benefit from dance, even if it's just like one couple dancing across the stage, just to show you how ingrained it is in this particular resort and how much of it is going on, and the contrast between the two dancing styles as well. I think there could have been more of that, and I think more set and more lighting maybe could have helped to assist that differentiation between the traditional ballroom dancing that they're teaching and then the dirty dancing that they are doing um, behind closed doors. I think I wanted to be able to tell that more distinctly. But those have been my thoughts on Dirty Dancing at the Dominion Theatre. If you have had the chance to see it already, or if you've seen uh, a previous version of this production, it has changed and adapted over the years. There have been various different sets, um, but these particular leading cast members have been with the show for a while, so you may have seen them before um, in a slightly different version of the show. Let me know in any case what your thoughts were in the comments section down below. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my stage YouTube channel. Go and check out some of my other recent review videos as well. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>